And we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 21 of the TechForge podcast here on the CrossForge Gaming YouTube channel. I am your host for this evening, Dynamo Ned. You can just call me Ned, though. And tonight, we have a lot to talk about, and so I've tried to condense things down as much as possible. But we have three main show topics and a few side topics to look at this evening. Everything from NVIDIA experiencing problems with their RTX technology, including uh, GPUs going up in flames. <laughs> uh, <That's right. laughs> Intel's refresh of their Skylake X processors, uh, or as a non-tech put it, refresh until it hurts. <laughs> and AMD's own refresh of the Radeon RX 590, which is a 12 nanometer version of the RX 580. Is it worth what they're asking? But first, let's take a look at some of the lighter pieces of tech news this week. All these were interesting to me, but uh, they're, they're not quite as directly related. But the first uh, is one that I know will be close to Hunter in particular. The Raspberry... Uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has released a new model of the Raspberry Pi 3 called the A+. It is a new version of the Raspberry Pi 3 that has less onboard RAM at 512 megabytes, but it also includes Bluetooth 4.2 and a dual-band Wi-Fi driver, or dual-band Wi-Fi chip, I should say, so that it can connect to 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Which is something that the previous uh, Raspberry Pi 2 A plus could not do. Yep. Now, the Damn. Model A plus is $10 less than the Model B plus at $25 versus $35 for the B plus. But, like I said, you do make some sacrifices. Uh, it has half as much RAM at 512 megabytes instead of one gig. And you do lose three of the USB ports and the Ethernet port. So if you're going to connect it by Ethernet to your network, you can't do that anymore. But if you're going to use Wi-Fi anyway, it's no major loss. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, but if you have does, a specific demographic, go ahead. Uh, but it does retain a full-size HDMI port, the CSI camera port, which is used for the Raspberry Pi camera, a DSI display port, in case you want to connect it to, I believe it's S-Video. And stereo output and composite video output as well as the micro SD card port. So. so I could think of a few uses for this, maybe appliances or robotics, especially with yeah. the dual band Wi-Fi. Um, beyond that, I don't know. It doesn't really have enough RAM on board for emulation um, unless you're running off of a non-GUI based uh, operating system to boot it. Then you're probably okay, but I yeah, it might have enough. I think it might have enough grunt for something like RetroPie, but uh, yeah, I, I would be. Well, on the other hand, uh, I know the Raspberry Pi Zero and the Zero W, which are also limited to 512 megabytes of RAM. Uh, they also can run versions of RetroPie, so. No, you're right. This is more marketed toward makers and people in the Internet of Things movement to use mm -hmm. as a dev board to as a springboard for their projects, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of projects done with the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, uh, the previous version to the B plus and the A plus. I've seen um, a handheld controller that has like basically like the um, 
Dreamcast controller where it had the screen in it, but that didn't have really a, that was more of a holder to put something in it. But I've seen where um, somebody built a controller with, this person had like a workshop and they can do all this stuff and 3D printing especially. Um, a controller that had the screen, the Raspberry Pi was under it and a mobile battery was inside the um, controller and the controller was made by a 3D printer. I've seen a... I've seen a small uh, laptop, like portable laptop, where it's um, a shape like this and it has a screen because you can get a seven inch screen to go with, to connect with the Raspberry Pi 3. I've seen a miniature um, cabinet, arcade cabinet, and there are, there is a way to run retro games on it. Um, this can run a lot of different operating systems, Linux mainly. There was at one time, which I was holding out for, a Windows IoT uh, distro, so I can have Windows 10 version sort of on a um, microcomputer. A lot of people use it for a Plex server uh, for streaming um, video and also for their to connect their um, external hard drive to and run a miniature server media server but I've seen yeah robotics I've seen that those projects I've seen a there was one that connected to the satellite and it there was a um, you connect something else uh, it's either the breadboard or something else to it where there, it lights up whenever the um, International Space Station is over the location of the Raspberry Pi. So it has GPS on it, too. And that was used to teach kids about making, making things with a small, with a small computer circuit board. There's a lot. There are YouTube videos on so many things that you can do with the Raspberry Pi 3. And now that it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you can... I'm sure somebody can, with a 3D printer can build their own phone or some kind of phone. Because uh, you can have... Uh, you can connect a Bluetooth headset to it and just have it as a audio or... Um, uh, listening to music and stuff. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't have a, so it's too too small to have enough RAM. Um, but you can. The Model B did have a gig, of, one gig of RAM. Hmm. This one, for some reason, has five twelve. So I guess it was because of the uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi took up too much of the space to have a gig of RAM. Well, I wish it, looks it could... Like, looks like they were, you know, trying to fit within a specific budget envelope. Yeah, yeah, so. that too. Well, they... the, the Model A Plus has always been a, a cut-down version of the B. Even with the original oh, okay. Raspberry Pi, the Model A was... It had the same CPU as the Model B, but it had half as much RAM. That's kind okay. of been the way it's been pretty much from the Raspberry Pi's beginning. Uh, the original Model A and Model A Plus both had 256 megabytes of RAM, Okay. whereas the original Model B had 512. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 2 doubled that for both the A Plus and the B Plus, or the both A and B, and then there were later models with the A Plus and B Plus that uh, were upgraded. And then we had the Raspberry Pi 3, B, and then the B+. Plus. Okay. Yeah, I do see the B+, plus has one gig of laptop DDR2 RAM. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, again, trying to fit within that power envelope... Yeah. They wanted to have a... Going with the older DDR2, 
uh, lets them run it at a lower power. Yeah. But there's probably going to be either the same amount of um, of uh, projects that the previous version had, or maybe some new stuff they'll be floating around. Yeah, um, I've seen everything. Probably the most... Well, let's say the silliest. It was actually a pretty neat idea. Uh, there was a family that had a a chicken coop in the back of their yard and they were wanting to monitor how much of the day the chickens were in the house versus outside and uh, this comes from my background uh, when I was growing up I did a lot of 4-H poultry project because the amount of sun that uh, the amount of sunlight that your chickens get can affect how well they lay mm. So they yeah. were wanting to see how often they were in the hen house versus how often they were out in the yard. So they took a Raspberry Pi 2, hooked it up to the camera module, and basically live streamed to a web page what, what the inside of their hen house looked like so they could monitor when the hens were there and when they weren't. And they programmed the Raspberry Pi to make note of how many chickens were in the image at any given time. <laughs> I know it sounds utterly silly, but it, for them, it was a totally legit use case. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, with little micro boards like this, as cheap as they are, you can totally do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy that there's something like that that exists on the market. I'll never forget, I, it was either the first or second version. I remember reading about a, uh, a university professor, like, making a supercomputer out of Raspberry Pis, and they made the racks out of Legos. Yes. <laughs> that because, was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen. Right, because if you chain a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis together, you know, at 35 bucks a piece, mm -hmm. you can take... 16, 32, 64 of them. And you basically have yourself a little server cluster for about the same price as a mid-range PC. Yeah. And at much lower power draw. Right. Right. And depending on what you have managing that, you could turn entire racks of them off, you know, depending on load. So... That's pretty cool, man. Speaking of lower power and developing uh, new technology, SK Hynix has announced that they have completed development on their 16 gigabit DDR5 5200 megahertz RAM. Wow. On the 10 nanometer process and with 1.1 volt operation. Wow. So, DDR5 operates on a by 4x multiplier. So what is that? So like, if you look at 3200, for example, it's basically RAM that operates at 1.6 gigahertz, right? Right, so, with a double data rate. Yeah. Divide by four. So, okay. So this memory runs at 1.3 gigahertz then. More or less. Um, Which would, speed-wise, it'd be the same as DDR4 2600. So, that's interesting. Yeah, they, uh, they are saying... Sorry, I, I said that incorrectly. I said 5,200 megahertz. It really should be 5,200 mega transfers per second. Yeah. Which is a bit different. The point well, being... Well, it's not your fault. The article states 5,200 megahertz, yeah. so... Yeah, the title. But 5,200 mega transfers per second, which means, essentially, it's moving data 5.2 or 5.2 billion times per second. Mm -hmm. 
uh, is roughly 60% faster than standard 3200 megahertz DDR4 RAM. Hmm. So in the article they state the same process is, is for 8 gigabit. So they, they basically doubled the capacity with this process for DDR5. Correct. That's pretty impressive, actually. And there's a 30% decrease in power, power consumption to boot? Yeah, versus 1.2 volts on DDR4. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, DDR5 is not as far off in the future as you'd think. Remember, we've been using DDR4 since 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was in the high-end desktop platform with X99. With, uh, I think that was the 5960X at the time. But, you know, it's been in the mainstream for almost three years now. And it probably won't be that long till we start seeing DDR5 in the high end debt in the high end desktop. If I had to guess, I'd say so, probably by 2020. And we've had DDR5 forever in the graphics area. I want to say the first card I ever saw it in was the 4770, maybe. It was ATI's 4000 series that had the first GDDR5 cards. So 4870 had it, and I want to say 4770 might have been the first time I'd ever seen it. But it might have been 4870, actually. I, I, I can't remember exactly. Right around there. Yeah, DDR5, or, yeah the graphics variant of DDR5 is old, but, you know, it's... Up until the last generation or so, it's been more than fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't till this generation with the introduction of GDDR5X at 11 gigabits per second over the 9 gigabits per second standard, and then the introduction of GDDR6 with the RTX cards that there's been really even a need to push beyond the GDDR5 standard. And let's not forget HBM and HBM2. Yeah. Um, probably mostly seeing uses in uh, server and enterprise. Right. Because, well, unfortunately, HBM, as powerful as it is, it comes with the problem of being very expensive to manufacture and thus yeah. being very expensive when sold. Right. So, well, chipset roadmaps, I want to say, could, I mean, we potentially could be seeing chipsets for DDR5 uh, around quarter two or quarter three of 2019. Right, Good. assuming the the next generation of AMD chips support DDR5, which mm. uh, it wouldn't surprise me, but I mean the fact that SK Hynix, which is one of the big three when it comes to memory manufacturing, is announcing that they've completed development on the process, which means they're ready to start production. Uh, indicates that we could be seeing it a lot sooner. We could be seeing it sooner than later. Well, and they they have they have hardware partnership with with companies that make chipsets professionally. So, um, you know, they're they're actively working with AMD um, and Intel and. You know, people that make all the ARM chipsets as well. So, right. So it's DDR5 is going to be definitely here in the next year to year and a half for sure. I, I would say you're probably right. Okay. And speaking of chips and chipsets, uh, recently spotted in the Sysoft Sandra. Uh, 
and user benchmark processor databases was the AMD Ryzen 7 3700U. Which the 2700U was AMD's high end APU system for notebooks. And if these early if these early uh, leaks in these databases are anything to go by, it looks like the 3700U is going to be very similar in design. And it's also looking like it's going to have a new form of graphics called Vega 10. You know, the uh, the current APUs typically had, uh, you know, they were Vega 3, Vega 8, Vega 11. But these are being branded as Vega 10 graphics. Oh, so 10, 10 compute units. Okay. Uh, assuming right. they're following the same naming scheme as before, probably. Isn't the 2700U using Vega 10? I thought there was another mobile chip that was using Vega 10. I don't have the specs in front of me, so I'd have to check to be sure. Hmm. But if what's been released about these engineering samples is accurate, the Ryzen 7 3700U will be another quad-core chip with eight threads that has a base clock of 2.2 gigahertz with a boost clock of up to 3.8 gigahertz. And given that this is an engineering sample, 2.2 gigahertz is probably on the low end of what we can inspect from the actual chip. Interesting. I'm sure it's a it'd be a great mobile chip. Eight threads, pretty solid APU. Yeah, the Vega 10, the 10 CU variant is also in the 2700U. Okay. Now, the thing that has some people confused is the fact that the Ryzen 7 3700U uh, has, is claimed in the SciSaw Sander database to have RX Vega 10 graphics, but in the user benchmark database, it claims to have uh, AMD Picasso graphics. Huh. Now, whether Picasso is a new generation of the Vega architecture for mobile, yeah, we don't know. Okay. Interesting. And so, uh, what's not known is what process these will be on. Uh, they're the general thinking is that the new Picasso graphics will, and the chips in general, will likely be produced on the 12 nanometer node, much like the Ryzen 2000 series on desktop. Yeah, uh, there's just there's not much to go on in this Tom's article that, you know, that where you could kind of guesstimate what what architecture the CPU is going to use. Um, I'm not sure about the APU though. 12 nanometer you said, potentially? Well, uh, the only thing we know for sure is that the Linux driver that leaked part of this information said simply, uh, AM, well, AMD's own Linux patch said, quote, Picasso is a new APU similar to Raven Ridge. So on videocards.com in the Picasso article, there is a reference to a client desk, desktop platform roadmap, which does list in 2019 Picasso, a Picasso APU for AM4. Right. And then some sort of a Matisse core for the CPU, which is beyond Pinnacle Ridge. Um, so, 
Oh, it's a Zen 2 CPU. Okay. Yeah, that's why they're saying Picasso is likely to be Zen Plus, whereas Matisse will probably be Zen 2. Well, Picasso's the APU, so Picasso's the graphic side. Matisse would be the CPU core code name, potentially. And then Castle Peak would be the... What? Oh, that's the HEDT. Okay. So that's the high-end desktop. Well, at least in this in this roadmap that I'm that I'm seeing here, um, I'll paste it in the uh, Google channel here. So, in this, if you scroll down to the roadmap, where did I have that? Yeah. So at the very bottom, they've got Picasso as the APU, and then Matisse is the CPU, and then in quotes it says Zen 2 CPU. So, but given the specs that we're seeing on the 3700U, I don't know if that's, I mean, we don't know what architecture it's using. 2700U is currently using Summit Ridge, I think, because they're on 14 nanometer, I think, so. Well, well, okay, remember though, the current generation of desktop APUs is Raven Ridge, right? Mm -hmm. the, the You had Bristol Ridge was the old excavator-based APUs. The A12-9800 and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Ryzen 3 2200G and 2400G are the Raven Ridge APUs. Okay. So Picasso should be the ones that are based... And remember, Raven Ridge is based on the original Zen CPUs. It right. uses the original Zen cores on 14 nanometer. Right. So if that pattern continues, Picasso should be based on Zen Plus, with Renoir being based on Zen 2. Gotcha. So, yeah, so if that's the case, then it'll be on Zen Plus. Okay, so th those clock speeds would make sense. Because Zen Plus, as nice as it is, and it it is a nice little bump up from Summit Ridge, it's not really that much of an improvement overall. Right, so. to, see, and to see similar processor speeds in the same power envelope is not surprising at all. I mean... 12 nanometer is not that much of a process jump from 14 nanometer. Mm -hmm. the, the change in density isn't sufficient to garner much more than about probably probably a 5 to 7% increase in performance. Which, I mean, if you look at when, you, when, you, when you're talking about manufacturing process, good binning at 14 nanometer could equal um you know decent binning at 12 in a right. lot of cases especially when you're looking at mobile parts there's probably some binning that goes on mm -hmm. so we will keep an eye out for new uh so we'll keep an eye out for new mobile APUs from AMD in the near future All right, and that brings me to the first big show topic for tonight. And that's NVIDIA's RTX woes. Because, well, <laughs> NVIDIA <laughs> has not had a good week for RTX. <laughs> They've not had much good RTX anything, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the one <laughs> bright spot is that if you're looking for the RTX 2070 and you have a mini form factor system... MSI is ready to help you get your RTX 2070 as they release the very first ITX form factor Turing card uh -huh. in the GeForce RTX 2070 Aero ITX. Yep. That's now, interesting having... that MSI would be first to market with this rather than Gigabyte or Zotac. 
Yeah, they're usually yeah. the ones who are first to this segment, but uh, this time it's MSI. Zotac especially, because I think I saw them having, like, they have a um, RX Vega Mini. Yep. I think it's the 56 Mini. Yep, they call it the Vega Nano, which... Uh, yeah. After the uh, the R9 Fury Nano, which... The what? Uh, the, R9, the R9 Fury Nano. Yeah, yeah. Which was an official name from AMD, but for Vega, there wasn't a Nano card released, all except for... Well... Oh, is that your Zotac uh, Mini 1070? 1070 Ti, yeah. Ah. The only right. difference is that the 1070... So this is the same PCB as the 1070? The 1070 Ti's got more cooler, though. That's what this extra bit is. Coming hmm. on the end. Neat. So, yeah. It's a nice yeah, hardware. That looks like the same as the ten seven the the ten eighty mini mm -hmm. of Zotec because it has a dual fan versus one fan. I didn't so, realize the the MSI variant of the twenty seventy was one hundred seventy five watt TDP. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, I figure it's by keeping it to the stock configuration and sticking with the single fan cooler. Is about the only way they're able to uh, keep it within that 175 watt TDP. I'm definitely interested in the overclocking and the thermals and the noise, but more so the thermals because I'm wondering how a one fan, even at it looks to be a hundred meg, um, hundred millimeter fan, possibly or 80. I don't know. Uh, just wondering about the thermals and the FPS, of course. Well, also, if it can, with the one fan, if it can handle ray tracing demand, because that's a well, ray tracing 2070 is a ray tracing. Yeah. Technically, ray tracing is enabled on the 2070, but uh, as we will discuss in a few moments. That might not be a wise idea. Yeah. So but, I don't know how much I trust this, but they do state that the TDP of 2070 is 175 watts. Huh. Of course, as we have seen, uh, TDP these days doesn't always mean what manufacturers want you to think it means. Yeah. This is true. I mean, we talked about last show... The 9900K and how manufacturers were absolutely abusing Intel specification to try and make the 9900K seem faster than it would actually be under Intel spec. Yep. Well, that's with CPUs, but with with graphics cards, they they are generally kind of spot on with their TDP ratings. Um, there are some workflows that will go beyond that sometimes, but. They're usually BIOS limited, depending on the card, uh, to that specific TDP. Unless Which, uh, you do some modification to them, like some sort of BIOS, or if you have an overclocking variant, then you can go outside the rated TDP, but most of the time they're kind of locked in at the BIOS level. So, but yeah, for CPUs, it's kind of all over the place. Speaking of all over the place, uh, NVIDIA finally admits that there is a problem with the RTX 2080 Ti, at least a few of the early Founders Edition models. Uh, in particular, when one gamer had his uh, EVGA RTX 2080 Ti XC literally burst into flames. <laughs> Uh, this That's comes hilarious. from Jason Evangelo over at Forbes, but he links to the said uh, RTX 2080 Ti XC from EVGA, uh, which uses the reference PCB, by the way. 
<laughs> uh, but here, I'll just share the photos. This comes from Hard Forum. Uh, let's screen share and present to everyone. Right. And so you can see here um, the card. It, it, it it's toasty. Oh my gosh. So now it's not just toasty, it's literal toast. Yeah. So now Nvidia fans can't uh, me included can't say that Radeon is a uh, heater. <laughs> wow. I suppose that is true. That's a power issue. That looks like a power spike. Yes, it does. Yeah. Cuz I'm pretty sure those are chokes. Yes, they are. And the in there, that and that's an incredible <laughs> amount of temperature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's hey, a Hey, it's the it's the best card for the winner. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's an amazing uh, amount of heat to be able to to melt and burn a PCB like that. Wouldn't that also mess up your system? Potentially. Well, I've Did had cards hard fry hard before, but oh. admittedly, the last car I had fry was uh, a GeForce. Gosh, uh, I think it was a GeForce MX four thousand, but it fried because it got struck by lightning. So oh, okay. there was a reason it fried. <laughs> wow! And it wasn't overheating. Was this guy? Um... I don't know from the article, but was he overclocking it or just running it? So he says, uh, I was just doing some web browsing, wasn't even doing anything else. Uh, everything was at stock, never even opened it up before. Wow. Suddenly the PC just turned off itself. I was wondering what went wrong when I looked into the side panel, then suddenly saw the graphics card shooting off flames at the edge of the PCB. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I feel so bad for this person. Like, how can you? I mean, you spent thirteen hundred bucks on like the flagship part, right? And you, there's a huge amount of pride. You get into your system, and then the first use of it, you're not even gaming with it. You're just your web browsing. Web. Your yeah. screen goes black. You open up the side panel, and or no, you don't even open up the side panel. You look through your tempered glass, and you see flames like yeah i got the gt card but my gosh man not literal flames so the the forbes article i find this humorous please they say please don't build your rtx 2080 ti system in system anyways in a uh, wooden case or anything flammable <laughs> that's that's funny wow and so NVIDIA did make a statement today about the seemingly unusually high number of flaws or faults that people were seeing with RTX 2080 Ti cards. And they said, quote, limited test escapes from early boards caused the issues some customers have experienced with RTX 2080 Ti Founders Edition. We stand ready to help any customers who are experiencing problems and please visit www.nvidia.com slash support to chat live with the NVIDIA tech support team or to send us an email and we'll take care of it. Wow. And uh, as Jason points out, what are test escapes but a very gentle way of saying that the underlying causes of the issues made it past quality control and into the hands of customers. That's a big test escape. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's that's like general testing right there, especially when you think that your PCB is designed around a few design uh, fundamentals, one of them being power delivery. That's a major test escape fault gap. Wow. And I'm sure... I'm sure NVIDIA will try to say, oh, well, the, the card that caught fire was probably just an issue with the way EVGA modified our card or blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, there. that's the reference PCB. Yeah. Yep. 
And uh, hopefully that guy had it um, registered his card with EVGA f- to get the warranty. I would hope so. Because if you don't, if you forget about it or choose to forget about it, because not many people, I don't know many, I don't know. Let's say I previously didn't do it with previous cards because I didn't think anything would go wrong. Of course, mine hasn't caught fire, but it's there's a lot of benefits to registering your card with the manufacturer that you get it. At least with EVGA, you get into their Step Up program, which is pretty awesome. I haven't done it, but it's it's pretty awesome from what I've read. But yeah, warranty and benefits definitely need to sign up for or register your card. Well, most of the time, as long as you still have your receipt, usually that's honored as the beginning of the warranty period. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, the The last time I had a part go bad on me was actually... Uh, it was actually a case part. The hmm. front panel on my NZXT M59 case. Uh, two of the USB ports burnt out. Oh, wow. So I contacted support. Uh, I sent a message. And they said, well, can you provide us your proof of purchase? And I, I, sent, it, I sent them a copy of that. And no questions asked. They sent me a new front panel for my M59 that I've been using nice. since. Nice. Yeah, I had a Corsair, was it? No, I had a Rosewill 600, 650 watt power supply that died on me one time and I contacted them and they were great with, you know, sending me a replacement. I had like a three year warranty or something and it still works fine. It's like six or seven years old now. I had a PNY uh, video card <clears throat> that stopped working because I upgraded to, I think it was Windows 7 at the time from Vista. And um, I went on their website. They didn't have any Windows 7 drivers for it. I contacted them and they said, refer to our website. I'm like, so you're not going to fix the issue. <laughs> and I just hated PNY ever since. Oh. Uh-huh. I have an Asus, a recent Asus story to tell you guys. Maybe later. <laughs> I've been dealing with their support on my one of my boards, so yeah. Oh, I have an Asus story as well, but that's something for another time. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Anyway, so RTX. The whole point of the line was ray tracing, right? It's what Jensen yep. Wong got up there and just absolutely hammered on in the original presentation. And up until this point, it's been a lot of promises, but nothing that we can actually see. And for two reasons. Number one, Windows 10, up until the 1809 update, did not implement DirectX ray tracing. And two, there had not been any games that implemented the type of ray tracing, the Tensor Core, or excuse me, the RT cores in the Turing cards could actually do anything with. And so with Microsoft finally releasing the 1809 update and with Battlefield 5 also releasing their patch, which enables direct X ray tracing, there's finally been some testing done with Battlefield 5 to see how much ray tracing affects performance. And uh, I've included in the links down below in the description a link to a video that Hardware Unboxed did. And the data they collected, there's no better way to put it than to say it's damning. Yeah, it is. Uh, what, 30% of the performance of the, of the non-ray tracing benchmarks? So, yes, in, in Battlefield 5, in the test they ran, and they ran it on multiple different maps and saw similar issues throughout. 
if you leave DXR off at 1080p, the RTX 2080 Ti was making about 150 FPS. When you turn on DXR, which is how uh, Battlefield 5 labels its ray tracing, you turn it on to DXR low. Your FPS gets cut in half to <laughs> 72 FPS at 1080p on an RTX 2080 Ti. Low. That's low. DXR. That's low ray tracing. Yes. Now, technically, there are three other presets, medium, high, and ultra. <laughs> but, uh, as I explain in the piece, what those middling settings, medium and high, do, uh, their performance was very similar to ultra. And so if you turn it up to DXR ultra, you get some very pretty ray trace reflections. But you absolutely tank your frame rate. Mm -hmm. You pay for it. Yep. You absolutely At pay for 1080 it. 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti with DXR Ultra enabled, yep. you achieve 49 FPS <laughs> versus 150 FPS with the feature off. Which in other words, one? you cut your FPS by a factor of three. Yeah, which on a non-G-Sync monitor probably means frame tearing. Mm-hmm. $1,300 video card. Then and you that... get a $500 G-Sync monitor if you get a 24-inch. Yeah. Or, you know, $700 or $800 for a 27-inch. And, yeah, and that's that's exactly the problem, is that if you don't have the RTX 2080 Ti and a high-end G-Sync monitor, you're even worse off, because the RTX 2070, which also technically has RTX enabled, is barely able to pull off 30 frames a second at 1080p with DXR turned to ultra. Maximum frame rate, maximum value. What's even better is I'm looking at the video and the um, running at 1440p on ultra DXR, 21 to 27 FPS. 21 average, or I think it might be at the one percent low. Yeah, 27 average, 21 one percent low. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. That's worse than a console. Well, I mean, not at 1440p, but it feels like it's worse. Uh, I believe the word you're looking for is cinematic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just if you like want a, movie. if you want a cinematic experience. Yeah, if you want a 1990s movie experience, absolutely. Because <laughs> now they're 45 to 60, maybe even higher than that. 75, maybe. I don't know. The but video Jason, the eye ahead. can't see more than 24 FPS anyway. <laughs> I don't see a difference. <laughs> It's horrible. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 1080p. $1,300 car. Can you even yeah. imagine going to 4K Ultra DXR? Oh my gosh. Yeah, dude. How, how, how would you like your slideshow uh, presented? Maybe 15, <laughs> 10 to 15 uh, FPS. Maybe. Like I said, how would you like your slideshow presented? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be dead like 20 times before you fi figure out what happened. It's ridiculous. Yep. Well, I mean, this is a this is technology, like I keep saying, this is technology that movie studios use for their movies. 
and they're trying to pull it down to a consumer video card. They yeah. obviously don't know how demanding and how um, huge dynamic uh, dynamic ray tracing for movies. It, it takes them like a couple months or more. Yeah, to process through. So yeah, they've got render. They've got very expensive render farms for that. Yeah. Yeah the 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 critical problem is that the RT the current RTX cards do not have nearly enough RT cores to handle the workload in a timely manner. They should have. Um, held off for at least maybe one or two more series of, car of cards. Maybe the 2200. Something to where they can more refine it to where it's actually worth paying for the price. Well, probably of, two there, or three generations away, if that. Yeah, uh, there's, there's definitely an argument to be made for that, but some generation had to be the sacrificial lamb to introduce yeah. the technology. I mean, think about this. Do you all remember when PhysX first came out? Yeah. yeah. And how badly it would cripple your game if you enabled it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, true. I mean, there was a while there. You had to have a separate PhysX accelerator card in order for your games not to be utter garbage. Yeah, I remember that. And now, and, I mean, now they can render most of that onto the GPU, either AMD or NVIDIA, or the CPU physics has gotten to a point where it's pretty good. So, I don't know. Of course, that it's been a... When did PhysX come out? I mean, what was around at that point? Dual-core Athlons? Um, Phys I was gonna say, yeah, physics. That would have been the mid two thousands. So you're probably looking at the first Athlon X twos, mm -hmm. and the, the, the early Pentium Ds. Okay. Because that was back when physics was not owned by Nvidia, and it was uh, a G. Mm -hmm. Definitely post Half Life Two, but right. The point of all that being, right now RTX is a mess. Yes, it looks beautiful when it's enabled, but it has bugs, and it will absolutely tank your performance. <laughs> But at the end of the day, to me, gameplay is a little bit more important than, ooh, the sky looks amazing. The and reflections I think that's probably true for awesome. a lot of gamers, to be honest. But just, you know, the current technique for handling this kind of stuff, which is screen surface reflections. Mm. For most people, particularly if you're playing a fast game like Battlefield, it's probably more than sufficient. Right. All right. So, I think we beat that horse enough. <laughs> Poor RTX. Poor RTX. So, let's move to a... Well, let's move to another company that's trying to milk a cow that has almost been tapped out. <laughs> and that is Intel. And Intel this week released their new Core i9-9980XE and their refreshed line of high-end desktop parts. Um... I say new, but I'm not sure that's really fair to the chip. Because the 9980 XE is, for all intents and purposes, 
a 7980XE with a slightly higher base clock. It is still 18 cores. It is still 36 threads. It's still a Skylake derivative. Exactly. It's still based on the Skylake X architecture. It's still $1,979. <laughs> In fact, if you look at the current 9000 series high-end desktop parts, they all look remarkably similar to the 7000 series high-end desktop parts until you actually get to the lower end of the stack. The funny thing is, the 9980XE was the chip sent out to most of the tech reviewers, but it's actually in the lower end of the stack where we see some of the biggest improvements. In particular, uh, take the i7-9800X, the successor to the i7-7800X. It gets a bump in its L3 cache, the amount of L3 cache per core, it's still an 8-core, 16-thread chip, yes. But it now has a base frequency of 3.8 gigahertz. And, unlike its predecessor, the 7800X, it has all 44 PCIe lanes enabled. So, this is kind of confusing to me because i9 consumer is 8-core, 16-thread. Uh, and it's a higher MSRP currently than this i7-9800X. I'm just... So the, the modeling methodology kind of... I don't understand why they went with an i7 here. And didn't just call it maybe an i9. Well, I think part of it comes down to... The i7-9800X is basically the lost leader to try and get you to buy the more expensive platform. Sure. Because X299 is significantly more expensive to build up than Z390. Yeah. And drop down. So, point being... I don't know what the use case is. The point being, all these chips, with the exception of the very top-end chips, generally have higher frequencies than before, typically have higher TDPs than before. Now all the chips are 165-watt chips, which, again, Intel is kind of abusing their TDP designation there, <laughs> particularly for the 9980XE. Well, probably 12 core on up. I could see that being an abuse. Honestly, so, 9920X up. Hmm. So, the... Uh, a non-tech went into an immense amount of depth in their analysis and I've included a link to their review because they they did a lot of really good work but uh there was something that they mentioned in their conclusion that I thought was really good what's that So, they say, their conclusion basically is, the 9980XE is, quote, an iteration when Intel needs evolution. In other words, they're saying, this is Intel making a incremental generational change what their high-end desktop parts really needs is a whole new architecture. Because we've been seeing Skylake X 
since 20 mid 2016 2017 mm-hmm. uh, at the very least mid 2017 because uh, x299 basically was Intel's rushed attempt to counter thread ripper so we've been seeing x299 for the last almost two years now and 9900 series isn't really much of a step forward it's basically a clock bump it really isn't well they've been they've been staying at the same architecture and i guess they're design teams have been working for uh, architectural designs around a completely different process note. So they're kind of at a, I guess, a holding pattern until they can come online with a different process note. But who knows when that's going to happen. So far, the signs are 2019, but we won't know for sure until they start releasing some product. So they're kind of in a holding pattern. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Ned. They're they're pretty much. It looks like they're pretty much at the limits of what they can they can do at fourteen nanometer. Yeah, and Anantech points out themselves the biggest uplift in performance they see from the ninety nine eighty XE over the seventy nine eighty XE was twelve percent in a compile test. That's it. In general, most of the improvements were single digit. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from 2% to 9%. Which they're getting that from probably, you know, the slight boost in L3 cache, the soldered TIM that they're using now uh, versus paste, which will allow them to boost a few hundred megahertz slightly higher, maybe. In a couple of workloads, but I mean, the only real advantage they have over Threadripper is the fact that they can hit higher clock speeds. So if if you're a, a user that needs a platform like this or like Threadripper, and your workloads need higher clock speed, then this is probably the platform for for you. But overall. They're pretty much at, at a limit, and it doesn't look like much of an upgrade over previous generation. So, yeah, I, I've also included links to a couple other reviews. Uh, one was a very deep dive review from Steve at Gamers Nexus, where he looks into overclocking performance, which he found to be rather disappointing for the 9980XC versus the 7980XC. But that at stock, it does represent a bump in certain workloads. And um, I also included a link to a, a more mainstreamish video from Linus over at Linus Tech Tips. Uh, what got me is that generally Linus tends to... He tends to approach these things fairly even keeled Mm -hmm. but when even he calls and says intel has no idea what to do that's literally the title of the video (laughs) i think that really points out the problem intel finds himself in yeah is until they can get 10 nanometer up and running until they can get something to succeed their 14 nanometer process they are stuck in a holding pattern and they have not been in that position ever and they don't know what to do well it's i mean thankfully there is competition in the market that's all i have to say because i highly doubt amd is going to have if you look at their past two major cpu releases they've gone pretty much flawless other than the the you know the the teething problems that they had bringing AM4 online, it did seem a bit rushed. But 
they were able to get those ironed out in six months with BIOS updates and OS patches. And uh, Ryzen 2 or Zen Plus has been very well received and has been pretty rock solid. So, and, and there, there's no indication to say that Zen 2 or Ryzen 3000 or the next Threadripper is gonna, going to be any different. I mean, they're, I don't know. Uh, it's probably realistic to expect an animator Ryzen in March or April without much of a problem. Um, so, and to further yeah. accentuate the point, when even as professional and uh, when as professional a place as a non tech, which is known for being as even handed as possible with their reviews. When even they take a swipe at you with a title for their review of Refresh It Until It Hurts, H-E-R-T-Z, <laughs> you know you've done screwed up. Oh, yeah. Well. But Intel is not the only one who is putting out refreshes this week. AMD is also putting out a refresh this week in the GPU space. Well, you thought... technically, yeah, technically it's a refresh of a refresh, so... Well, yeah. yes. But it, it is... It, it, it does at least feature a new process node in the move from... Uh, when Polaris originally debuted in 2016 with the RX 480 which I have a pair of RX 480s in my system. I love them. They've been solid workhorses for me. And they play pretty well, too. Uh, that quickly got refreshed about a year later into the RX 580, which basically was a clock bump and was a, a brute force attempt to make the RX 480 faster which unfortunately massively jacked up the power draw. You know, the RX 480 in its base form uh, has a TDP of around 150 watts. Yeah, the RX 580 is a little closer to 180, 185. I think it's officially 175, but uh, it, you, you take an RX 580 you'll find it pulls a little closer to 200 watts. And Tom's points out that the new RX 590 is AMD's first 12 nanometer GPU, which maybe this is AMD taking a look at their mid-range and saying, well, let's see how this does on this 12 nanometer node and see if it gives us the performance gains we're looking for. Of course, it could just be kind of a stopgap thing until the new 7 nanometer Vega and 7 nanometer Navi cards come out. That's possible, too. But Tom's hardware points out in particular that the RX 590 is a 12 nanometer GPU which should give you some power gains over 14 nanometer. Again, not huge, but at least some. Mm -hmm. But it hits 225 watts. Does it really? Okay. Huh. Okay. And so... You know, the... Yeah, here it is. So the RX 580 has an official 185 watt TDP, whereas the RX 590 is rated at 225 watts. So you're well into the point of diminishing returns there mm -hmm. with 590. Now, the move to the 12 nanometer process, should, in theory, should give you around a 12% bump in performance. And considering the RX 590 is clocked about 15% faster 
than the RX 580, it obviously takes advantage of all that performance. Well, yeah. And, I mean, when you're looking at benchmarks, I want to say the average the average delta is somewhere between 10 and 15% anyway. So, as in terms of performance increase. So, I didn't realize it was a 225-watt TDP card. Hmm. Because that puts it north in power consumption of 1070 Ti. I want to say it's between 1080 and 1080 Ti, honestly. In terms of power power draw, that's right around Vega fifty six because Vega fifty six stock BIOS is limited to two hundred ten watt TDP anyway. Yeah, so um, that's kind of disappointing from a power draw standpoint. Yeah, the RX five ninety, uh, they they put them side by side here over in Tom's. They have a nice little chart that puts it all side by side here. Um, so the RX 590, its base clock is 1469 megahertz, which, remember, the base RX 580 boosted to 1340 megahertz, whereas mm. the RX 590 boosts to 1545. It's pretty significant for an AMD GPU. It really is. And that also helps in compute performance as well. The RX 580 is nominally rated for 6.2 teraflops, whereas the RX 590 gains about 900 megaflops to 7.1 teraflops. Uh, which... Uh, Basically, what that means is that to achieve the RX 590, what AMD has done is they've cranked the power slider almost as high as Polaris can stand. Well, we're probably seeing what we're probably seeing the extent of what Polaris in you know this particular case can do. I hate to say it, I really like Polaris. Well, but... it was an excellent very power efficient GPU in the RX 480 almost three years ago. Yeah. But on the other hand, well, I say almost three, more like two years ago. But on the other hand, NVIDIA hasn't released anything new other than the RTX cards in that time period either. <laughs> well, and they've been botching that up up and down the line so and so you name it they've had all kinds of issues there's reddit forums that are tracking major you know major batch issues that 2080 ti's and 2080s are having yep the prices the power draw the performance is there but in non-ray tracing benchmarks and workloads but just not reflective of the price yeah and AMD, I mean, as much, I absolutely love Vega, absolutely love it, but you have to be willing to get your hands dirty and configure it, you know. If you tweak it, you can you can get really good performance out of it, but at the expense of some power draw, too. And they're just, I, I think we're waiting for next generation GPUs, really, and we don't have them yet. Yeah. Um, Tom's points out you were talking about power draw here's what they have to say about the RX 590 the Radeon RX 590 may benefit from a tuned process but it's still being flogged for a few percentage points of additional performance it's sucking down GeForce RTX 2080 power to generate frame rates between a GTX 1060 and 1070 Yeah. Again, remember, when it came out as the RX 480, which is the card I have, it was a 150 watt part. And its performance at that power level was quite exciting because it was extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. And it gave you excellent performance at that rating. 
you know, the RX 580, they cranked the clocks a bit up to 185 watt TDP. And the performance per watt was still okay. It wasn't quite as good, but it mm. still did fine. And the RX 590, even with a tweaked process, they've cranked the clocks to the point where I think we've hit the point of diminishing returns. Yeah, that's probably a pretty accurate statement. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I mean, we're dealing with three-year-old technology, even though it's on a new process node. It's still a three-year-old architecture. And, you know, they've... It's impressive what they've been able to do with it, but it's time for something new. Yeah. It really is. And at $280 MSRP, it's really hard to justify the RX 590 at that price. I mean, obviously, there are some people who that'll be worth it for them. I don't know. I think... It, it's. I don't think it's a great deal. I don't think it's necessarily that bad either. Considering where it kind of stands in the product stack or the performance stack between 1060 and 1070 performance, because I want to say 1070s are still around 350. I mean, somewhere around there. So or 450 depends on the cooler. Yeah. And admittedly. Oh, this is largely AMD attempting to fill in their own product stack a little bit. Because there was that huge gulf between the RX 580 and Vega 56. Yeah, I mean, even now, RX 580 typically running right around $200 US. Mm -hmm. RX 5 or Vega 56, the cheapest one of those you find are right around 350 Right now... I mean, yeah. but that's been, you know, right after they debuted, they said an MSRP of 400 but I want to say that the price went right up to 500 and then... Then it went up to crazy cryptocurrency prices. Yeah. Only over the over the summer has have the prices come down to a point where Vega is relevant again. Um, for the performance you get at 350 and $400, it's pretty good. It's pretty good value. Yeah, because you're getting performance around a GTX 1070 Ti, slightly mm -hmm. faster if you're willing to tweak it, for slightly less money. Right. It's going to eat more power, but it's not a crazy difference. It's not that much more. So, 1070 Ti is right around 180 watt card. Vega 56 stock is right around 210 to 220. So, But as uh, Gamer Nexus demonstrated not that long ago, if you're willing to power mod your Vega 56, you can make it drink up to 600 watts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I say this as an example because I've been doing a lot of my own tweaking. Vega 56 is very configurable. It's very easy to mod. Very easy. Yeah, it's not have... hard. And I I mean, you have to give AMD credit because the reference design, the VRM reference design is one of the strongest that's currently out there right now. Because it can put, it can take a lot of abuse. <laughs> And still yeah. keep on trucking. Any car that can take the kind of abuse that gamers Nexus and the like are willing to heap on it and still just oh, yeah. keep on trucking <laughs> is it pretty well designed. Yeah. VRM-wise, it's fantastic. But it will eat power if you let it. It will eat power. Hunter, you got anything to add? Oh, not really. So I haven't had experience with the RX uh, 56 other than, well, not experience with it, but I'm definitely willing to check it out at some point when I can get a good price on it. Yeah, if you can, if you can find a good deal on a non, 
I mean, if you're looking at the used market, you know, if you can find it for around 300 or less, and it's just been in gaming use. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking on a, eBay right now. It's a super fun card to tweak. Speaking of deals, uh, <laughs> we generally try to feature some hardware deals at the end of the show every week. No. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a couple of these deals are the reason why I think the RX 590 is not really worth it at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, there's certain use cases where the RX 590 makes sense, but given these deals, this is part of the reason why I personally can't recommend it. Yeah, I can totally agree with you on that, on that standpoint with what you're about to say, Mr. Ned. <laughs> uh, the first one... Uh, this is from Newegg. It is the ASRock Phantom Gaming RX 570 4 gig card. And it is currently on sale with two free games, no less, for $149. Hey, Ned. Yeah? I just muted my burp. <laughs> I, I just muted it because I wanted to okay. be nice. Um and my burp is done, and it felt great. So um, duly noted. Duly yes. noted. So the the deal you're about to say is really fantastic, and I appreciate <laughs> you, Ned. Because yeah, this is the quality content you come here for, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yep. Uh, so yes, one hundred and fifty dollar Asrock Phantom Gaming RX five seventy four gig card. Probably the best deal out there right now in 1080p gaming. Because this will play 1080p high and a lot of titles 1080p ultra. And with no sweat. Yep. Or if you want to spend a little more and you want something like the RX 590 that also has 8 gigs of GDDR5 and has uh, 2,304 stream processors, just like the RX 590, but is clocked a little bit lower and costs almost $100 less. Also from Newegg this week, you can get the MSI Radeon RX 580 Armor 8 gig for $189.90 after a $20 mail-in rebate. Yeah, I mean, oh. at that price, you can't beat it. Even though it doesn't have a backplate and it comes with arguably no cooler at all at that price, <laughs> you really can't beat it, honestly. I would rather buy that and put it on my own cooler, especially if the uh, Morpheus... If there was a Morpheus style cooler that you can put, like Arctic makes um, mm -hmm. two dual fan or triple fan um, add on coolers. If those will work for the 580, that would be worth it. Yeah, you could the, probably put in a, uh, an Accelero S3. Yeah. Or even the, the uh, armor think... doesn't fit all the way on doesn't um, stretch all the way on the, the PCB. There's a lot of, there's a little bit of um, on the bottom, a little bit of space that's not cooled. Yes, uh, admittedly, the armor line from MSI is basically their entry level line. But yeah, it's... that said, uh, I've used armor cards in the past, and at stock, they work just fine. Now, if you want to try to overclock your RX 580, yeah, you might want to consider something a little nicer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently running... The, the model I'm running, I bought it before the cryptocurrency boom, right after the RX 480s came out. It's the XFX GT-R edition. And they were about 265 at the time. And... They have dual fan coolers. It covers the whole PCB. They have backplates. They cool just fine. 
uh, assuming they get enough airflow. Uh, that was a problem I had with my current case. It had one of those nice, fancy-looking acrylic fronts that unfortunately choked off all the airflow. Mm. So I had to remove it, and so I'm running with basically a piece of mesh on the front of my case right now. But it doesn't overheat anymore. Mm. So... Uh, it was a case of the case being the problem and not necessarily the hardware. Mm. Airflow. Yep. Yeah. And there's a reason I'm considering moving back to my Corsair Graphite 600T. Because, yes, that thing is massive, but I have not seen a case yet that has as good airflow. Silverstone, Mesh by C. Yep. Yes, but I, I don't want to spend money on a new case. Ah, uh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, well, unless I absolutely got have to. Yeah, unless you got... I mean, if you've already got something laying around the house that works, you know, by all means. Although, I am going to have to take the air compressor to it if I do, because it's been a while since my 600T got dusted out. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, I think we're just rambling at this point. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in and watching us. Uh, if you've enjoyed this content, you can find much more of it here on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find links to our other social media, including our Facebook community group, which is quite lively and ever-growing, a link to our Discord community, which is mm -hmm. similarly also growing quickly, a link to our Twitch channel, where you can view us live streaming content five days a week, mm -hmm. and sometimes even more often than that, uh, when we get the notion and the time. 26 hours a day? If you can make those physics work, sure. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Anyway, my point is, thank you for watching this episode of Tech Forge. Uh, gentlemen, do you have any last thoughts before we close? No, I pretty much peaked when I was talking about muted burps. Not <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I can think of. All right. Well, I've been Dynamo Ned, your host for this evening. This has been the Tech Forge Podcast. And remember, when life has you down, forge on. Yep, forge on. Hmm?